the War of 1812, medicine, the gasket surgery case. So uh, basically the way this project started, I, I came down uh, for a research trip um, and took a uh, look at the Museum of Healthcare's holdings of related material, which will be on, is, is on display over at the Agnes. Um, so I looked at this surgeon's case. I think Jan and Paul had this idea. It's like, all right, we have this surgeon's case from the War of 1812, and you know, gruesome stuff happened with the gear in this case. And then this artist seems like he knows what he's doing with gruesome things. <laughs> and he's able to tweak it. So let's see what happens, right? So, so I come down and I check it out, and I'm like, okay. Um, I was already kind of sensitive to the issue that how am I going to do this? Because I think in the past when I have uh, art projects, um, thematically it's usually a little more open. For At first I felt it was really confined. I was like, whoa, it has to be time sensitive, 1812. And then it has to be about medicine. So there were these like parameters. I'm like, can I work within these parameters? And, um, and I was also sensitive to the issue that, okay, this is War of 1812. Um, and, you know, I don't have any major pro or con uh, you know, about war per se, but I also didn't want to come off, like, coming off as a cheerleader. I think, um, being based in Ottawa, I think there was a lot of discussion about the war uh, museum when it went up. So I was a little sensitive to the idea of, like, okay, I don't want to be, like, a cheerleader, I don't want this to be, like, uh, cultural propaganda or something like that, and, you know. So, um, I kept that in mind. So there was kind of, I guess, maybe notions of maybe a derisive, a reverent tone uh, that I wanted to take when I address this project. And right from the get-go, uh, you know, I was like, oh, a project about war. Well, what are my most kind of basic innate feelings, <gasps> memories about war, being in a generation that, you know, obviously didn't serve in any wars. Um, so I was like, well, I was a kid. I, you know, played with guns, uh, fake guns, and played a lot of video games. And immediately, the whole concept of war, the seriousness, kind of dissolved into this idea of entertainment and amusement and fun. So I was like, hmm, and then it's the body. And then I started thinking about, um, well, I started thinking about this. I was thinking about the game Operation. So I think, you know, from the get-go, I was thinking about, hmm, amusements. You know, this would be a good way to weave such a kind of serious, dire topic. And, you know, lighten it up uh, and maybe come with a critical angle, but it doesn't have to be, you know, it could be accessible and a little bit light. So the first idea I had, um, how did I get to this? I don't know if anyone's heard of the pinball, but uh, originally one of the ideas I had was to try to blur the boundaries uh, between instruments of war and instruments of healing. And you know, based on even seeing these items, you know, you can kind of um, mistake mistake the two, like a you know. So, but it, instead. Um, of finding similarities of interest, I reacted more to the difference between uh, early 19th century weaponry and its modern equivalent uh, in terms of their impact on the human body. So that's when I had this idea. The pinball idea arrived um, upon reading surgical accounts of musket ball removal and their characteristic wonky and circuitous path in the human torso, opposed to the bullet, <coughs> its uh, streamlined counterpart. So that's when I had the super lightning rod idea. You know, this is the first idea that I had for the show, um, which is a retheme pinball machine that viscerally highlights the uniquely destructive character of musket balls upon the human body. And, uh, you know, this is one of those ideas, I think after research I was having a pint down the street with a friend and I was like, hmm, this would be cool. But, you know, given my history of mostly doing painting and drawing, I was like, yeah, this is one of those ideas. It's kind of like, you know, when you're in university, you think like, oh yeah, this is a great idea, but like, you know, it never comes into practice. But somehow, some way, oh, I guess I'll, I'll go right to the machine. Uh, it happened. This is kind of like a, a futuristic thing. And then how did it happen? Well, uh, I got in touch. I was telling a friend of mine that I went to art school with the, about this project. And he's like, oh, you got to talk to my brother's friend. He's like a hardcore pinball geek. And uh, it's like, they call it pinheads, right? They call themselves pinheads. And, uh, so I went and talked to him, and coincidentally, he and a, a friend of his recently just released a board game about the War of 1812. So this guy was hardcore in the War of 1812 and hardcore in the pinball. So he was really keen on, on the project idea when I proposed it. So he really helped me source a used pinball machine. So this is the original pinball machine play field we have here. Hey, I have a pointer or something, right? Is that somewhere in here? Yeah. Uh, anyways, 
the, it's, it's on the left here. That's the original pinball machine play field that I got. It's a pinball machine called Pinball Pool, and it's from 1970s, uh, late 70s, 78. And it's an electromagnetic, uh, you know, system. And that's the original play field. And then, you know, then on the on the right side, that's like a, a classical anatomical illustration that I was, I was looking at and using it as sort of a, a guide, a, a map uh, of sorts of how to kind of create this play field that I wanted to do. Other images I was looking at included uh, that one, and this one's from a Japanese uh, medical history book from the, uh, the late 1900s. There, there are some instances where, you know, I think just based on my East Asian drawing tradition style that I, I do refer back to some uh, Asian Asian components in the work. So as I was working on the play field, what I did was I had to break down, really break down the, the, the previous one and rearrange it so it looked at, at, at like a human torso. So this is kind of a, a general kind of computerized mapping that I made uh, of the play field. And then everything got was hand painted uh, meticulously and then it, it became this. So that's the play field. Um, you know, everyone should go over and give it a try because it's totally addictive. And, uh, <laughs> and it's interesting. This, you know, originally on the side here, here, uh, these these used to be numbers, right? It was pinball pool. So this is where the cue ball, like this is the, the thing you break. So these drop targets here, they're called drop targets. They uh, are associated with uh, the letters associated with the letter here. And before it used to be just numbers and numbers, and it made more sense. But I had to figure out, hmm, what seven letter, two seven letter words I can include on the two sides here um, that, you know, that would make sense for the piece. So I stuck with mangled viscera. And, uh, but then when I, you know, correlated the, the, the letters, then this is just like a jumbled mess. My friend looked at it and was like, that looks like it's Latin. He thought it meant something else. Um, so anyways, there's that component of it. And I guess I'll go back to a little thematic point. So as I'm working on, on this project, what I found interesting was uh, the, the idea of the pinball machine led me to think about this gaming interface and the conflation of war technology and gaming and, um, and just the whole idea of like a gaming interface and how it dis disassociates uh, a person from the realities uh, of inflicting physical trauma. So this, as you can see, is, these days is prevalent in soldier recruitment uh, video games, which is uh, the one on the top here is called America's Army. Um, so they have these like free games that, you know, high school kids can just download for free and get really into like all these kind of war games that are hyper real and then, you know, boost recruitment. Um, and then there's also this uh, emergence of um, unmanned drone warfare that I'm sure some people have heard about. Um, so basically taking video game to the real level where you're really nowhere close to um, the people you're inflicting uh, bodily harm and killing. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to, people to think about, I guess, with the game. I think at first it's super attractive and, and fun. It's like a carnival. Um, yeah, and you're playing it, you're like, there's, you know, sounds, and it, it, it's, it's kinetic, and it's colorful, and, and you kind of forget the fact that, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, il illustrating the, the damage a, pinball, uh, a musket ball uh, inflicted on, on the human torso in that era. So here we have the, the, the back glass on the pinball machine, which uh, you see the original one on the left, pinball pool, um, cute girls and robots, and then... And then the, the, the one I, 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 uh, I created, um, this was created, uh, I illustrated uh, this figure, main figure, um, and all the components were illustrated individually and they were later scanned into uh, the computer and I composed it that way. It has a lot of reference to this Brock uh, painting, which makes, I'm, I'm glad for Ali's like, the, uh, talk, there was the, his, uh, his uniform with the musket hole. So yeah, so that's that's one piece. That's kind of like the easiest piece of, of the show for me. I think conceptually, it was like the lightning bolt. Um, it was more technically, um, was it gonna work? You know, is the paint gonna chip off? All these more formal and technical issues. Uh, I'll just add that I had uh, audio samples put in um, of gunshots. So when you play it, I've subbed in the original sound effects. So it's 
kind of like this uh, rainfall, uh, this mist of, of gun, gunfire. Um, one interesting thing I did, uh, uh, thing I did feel uh, when I was working on this pinball machine was, uh, was I don't know, this, the pinball machine was at this height that was around the height of a, a, a surgery table. And I'm just working there late at night, and there's these like connections, right? I have this X-Acto knife in this photo, because I'm doing a, a really uh, old school painting technique called uh, hard edge painting, which was like popular in the 70s. And it's interesting because the machine is from the 70s also. But I was doing this, and I was just like, it feels like I'm working, I'm like conducting surgery. And it's late night, so it also felt like there's the whole history of grave digging, and, and people like grave digging and uh, body snatching and people doing that for anatomical study um, before. So uh, this is something I kept in mind as I was working on, um, on, on some of the other pieces in, in the show, this idea of the operating, the, the theater of operations. So that's one piece, kind of the, the most kind of fun piece. And then, then the other directions I was kind of thinking while I was um, we're thinking about this project. I was like, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a visible minority. A lot of times my work addresses themes and subjects, uh, you know, from a minority's point of view. And I was like, well, I would like one mind kind of exploring uh, more about the Aboriginal role um, in the war. And I guess with regards to the medical aspect of, of the show, I was like, Hmm, I, maybe I want to study um, maybe Aboriginal healing practices of the era, uh, maybe juxtapose it with we uh, Western medicine, etc. But um, I didn't, uh, I didn't find too much that I can really sink my teeth uh, into. But what I did find uh, of interest was um, the study of humorism at the time, which is, is um, you know, also before this before germ germ knowledge. Um, and I found that humorism, the whole study was like kind of comical, you know, it's not, you know, it wasn't, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, insensitive to be like, haha, you guys are so stupid back then, you know, you guys are feeding each other, met, uh, you know, um, mercury and stuff as a medication and you thought, you know, this was the science. But, you know, like even now, you know, far, like how, how frequently are there like pharmaceutical news about, oh, this drug we thought was really awesome for this now gives you like, you know, colon cancer or something like that. I don't know. But uh, so it, that, that thread of like the ever morphing uh, knowledge of science and medicine, uh, you know, constantly changing is, is, was in there. So I was interested in that. But I think most of the headway I made was when I made, went to, um, the Queen's uh, Anatomy Lab. Paul took me to the Anatomy Lab, and uh, I was immediately, you know, very uh, interested um, at, at all the objects and the, the craft of dissection and the beautiful anatomical dis displays. I was imme immediately thinking about body worlds and this like ex exposing of the of the inner. And then then I also kind of thought like, you know, if we we want to talk about like history, um, you know, there's a metaphor here. It, it almost seemed like uh, you know, wh when you go, when I saw the anatomy, it's all flayed open. It's like, whoa, this is, this is the truth. Like, there's no flesh, there's no facade. This is like the real stuff inside, you know. Um, so I kind of saw that as a, a strange metaphor about, like, history. About, um, uh, you know, much like documented and tweaked history posing as the truth. I wanted to create an anatomical sculpture that looks beyond the exterior to provide an exploded view. Um, so I was thinking, I think I want to make an anatomical sculpture, and it'll have distortions and mutations in it, and uh, that kind of mirrors, uh, you know, the distortions of history. As I, when I was doing research, I was like, "Well, these are very fact, you know, interesting information," but I was like, "Yeah, you know, I, I guess I'm a skeptic with history, just because the whole history is written by winners kind of idea." So I was like, "Okay, anatomy, hmm." anatomical sculpture and distortions. Immediately, with the same kind of gaming idea, I thought about this figure. This figure is uh, Goro. He's from um, he's from this video game Mortal Kombat that I used to play as a kid. Um, pretty violent game. Anyways, I, I was kind of taking... He, he doesn't have two heads. He actually just has uh, four arms. But I, I started playing around with Photoshop. That's when I created this kind of Siamese figure. 
And there's an illustration here of uh, kind of Siamese uh, rib cage. So I kind of had a structure of how I wanted to build it. At the time, I was also there was some bleed over into my previous research about um, Chinese immigration, and uh, one of the most prominent, uh, you know, Asian Americans for early Asian Americans were these N twins. They were, um, they, they, I guess they were a big sideshow kind of freak, and they were very successful, um, you know, wealthy and whatnot. But I was really interested um, from that point. Sorry, this really jumps around, but this whole idea of like also, also ethno, ethno exoticism it, as a display. So the angles, the vectors, you know, changed from, well, anatomical spectacles, ethno exotic uh, kind of spectacles. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, so, I, you know, these are things I was thinking about while I'm working on a sculpture. Anatomical spectacle, body oddities, ethno exotic displays. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, and then I started researching uh, natural history museums, right? And, uh, you know, kind of race-based sciences a little bit after the War of 1812. But, um, so these are, these are sciences that basically, you know, like polygenicism would state that humans of different race uh, did not evolve from the same one um, kind of monkey, that we were all of the dif different species. So here's like a very interesting illustration of, um, yeah, like all the different races in the world and then the um, corresponding animals that fit and uh, skull shapes, etc. So this is also my thinking. There was also a recent exhibition called Human Zoos that was in, in, in France. So I was kind of looking into that, the whole ethno-exotic display. So this is all in my thinking. Um, but how did I, how is it going to, you know, pull in this Aboriginal kind of component that I wanted to incorporate. Well, I did f find, uh, I guess I was mostly gravitated to the figure, mythical figure of Tecumseh, because, you know, everyone, I think he's one of these, uh, I guess the main figure, like, historically, that's, that's kind of spoken about. So one of the books I, I read was a, a book actually by uh, Guy Saint-Denis, who's a prof here at Queen's, and it was all about Tecumseh's bones and how there's been a long kind of searching for his remains so he can be monumentalized and commemorated uh, around the site of where he was uh, of killed. So, so I, I, I was thinking a lot about Tecumseh as a figure, um, what he meant symbolically for um, Aboriginal North Americans, because at the time he was uh, trying to build a confederacy of uh, Aboriginal tribes to fend off uh, American Western expansion, and that's how the partnership with Canada uh, kind of happened, or the Britain happened. Anyways, it, you know, it's kind of a sad story with, with his death, so um, led to kind of the dream of a, um, a united Aboriginal kind of front in the Midwest. You know, much of it I kind of think about as like this picture of, of uh, bison skulls, which, you know, bison skulls a lot of times metaphorically, you know, used as a loss of a lot of Aboriginal lives in North America. So here's a little detail of um, a component of my sculpture. There's a little mystery, you don't know what's on top. But, um, so I kind of tried to build up a little kind of mound of skulls kind of to uh, symbolize um, kind of similar to this bison imagery. Um, so given that it was monument kind of a monument, anti-monument. Um, I also thought about um, an artist in Ottawa, um, who I'm familiar with, uh, Jeff Thomas. And um, he uh, kind of alerted me to um, a lot of sculptural monuments around our country um, and this uh, presence of a, a scout figure, um, an Aboriginal figure, it's a lot of times kind of just a general kind of Aboriginal figure. Depictions of a general Aboriginal figure in our national monuments Spurs concept of an anti-monument, a critique of cultural usages of Indianness to develop a national identity despite the troubling history and current community support issues. So, all so these kind of ideas were kind of in, in my head, um, um, and then also I was also considering um, this whole I appropriation of um, of native culture in the naming of war technology. This associates with the pinball machine. Uh, like the Apache helicopter, or uh, or the or the um, 
Tomahawk missile. Um, so I have not included an actual image of, um, of my sculpture. That, that's kind of the thing. I, I purposely didn't really include much images of any of the finished pieces, so you guys will have to walk over after the talk. <laughs> so, um, and one thing while I was working on the sculpture, I guess I can show you some of the pro procedural uh, work. Here is uh, me kind of uh, taking two anatomical skeletons and then fusing them. There's my assistant uh, kind of grinding away at the teeth. And uh, it was very interesting because once again the surgical table kind of feeling came about. But also when I started fusing the two skeletons, um, it's, the, a narrative started to form and it supported this allegory of a force merger between Britain and the indigenous confederacy. And uh, I guess I can show you experiments with expanding foam. So this is, this is a little preview shot, so I don't know why it's doing that. Um, this is kind of something I, I, I played with, is uh, uh, this expanding foam stuff, which you'll see, which I, I enjoyed quite a bit. But there's no major conceptual meaning towards expanding foam. It's just <laughs> pretty cool to see expand. Um, so, uh, my other option, uh, I think I was over at Dr. Greg Barron, who's a really hardcore war, uh, doctor and researcher of war practice, uh, surgical medical practice of the time. And uh, Paul took me over to his office when I was on research. And, um, and what happened was, you know, I was trying to ask him about medical inaccuracies and mistreatments and I wanted you know these erroneous treatments to somehow connect with erroneous history kind of something like that so I was kind of like on that tangent for a while but then uh, I moved away from that and I, I asked them about cowardice like situations when soldiers are being cowards because from a lot of my research I think with Paul it's like oh soldiers are so tough there was no anesthesia they're just getting their limbs sawed off and they would wouldn't make a noise they just like have a cigarette and like you know be super tough right I was like yeah that's one narrative yeah soldiers are tough but then it's like how about the ones that, that aren't and what, what happens with them right so uh, Dr. Greg Barron told me about this whole phenomenon of feigned and factitious diseases which are instances where soldiers either uh, like self-injured themselves uh, to avoid war, or took a pre-existing ailment and then would you know further aggravate it, so it would never heal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know the money is is this essay right on feigned and factitious diseases, and uh, by Dr. Hector Gavin. Anyways, this was a gold mine, a major gold mine of hilarious stories of cowardice and uh, the interesting thing for me uh, when I was researching it, it because what it is is a, a guide that doctors almost wrote for other surgeons it's like well if a soldier is kind of faking this these are the tests you can do to find out if they're faking or they're real so it's a very sensitive line like what if this soldier isn't lying and you are throwing him in a river because he think he claims he's paralyzed, and you throw him in the river because that will show if he actually is or if he isn't. Because you have to swim. Out. It's like, but there's that sensitive line because it's like, well, we don't want this soldier to get their pension, and they're you know they're lying to us. But then there's the issue. It's like, well, we're gonna kill this guy, and he's actually really hurt. So that kind of you know uh, you know duality tension. I, 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 I amuse it. I find it, I find it very amusing. Um, so I will go into maybe um, some of the, the little ditties. I can talk to you in the gallery maybe about it if this runs long. But I was also interested that a war was going on, let's say between Britain and the US. But then like in the medic tents, there's this like battle between the patient and, and, the, and, and the prescriber and a rivalship of invention and perseverance. So there's this kind of like internal, like outsmarting battle going on, which I also found it, you know, very meta and enjoyable. So how was I going to illustrate? My idea was, you know, I'm going to illustrate. I'm going to illustrate some of my favorite kind of uh, snippets from this from this essay. So what style was I going to do it in? Right. Um, well, first I was thinking very much about 
all these classic action, heroic war like illustrations and paintings. They're you know, super heroic, super epic, all this stuff going on. And um, I think you, everyone will know based on my work that I'm you know, kind of just like an adolescent boy. But uh, anyway, so these are the images I was looking at. Looking at. I was like, okay, I think I want to make like a war panoramic that normally shows a lot of heroism, a lot of action, but instead it'll be a panorama of soldiers inflicting harm on themselves or etc. So these are sort of the images I was looking at. And then, uh, let me, okay. so I'll kind of get to these guys, right? So this is what I ended up doing. It's hard to see. I, I chose deer hide parchment as a, a medium to work on. Um, I found it, I found it was great because it, it kind of provided this double meaning. Uh, because the, the parchment itself, each of them are quite, in, you know, unique because they, um, they, they're imbued with the markings, bruisings, trauma on the deer uh, itself. So there's like buckshot holes in it, bruises and trauma. So on that, I've superimposed illustrations of soldiers um, kind of inflicting trauma on themselves. So, for instance, it's hard to see the quality isn't the greatest. This, this guy's kind of slicing off his uh, Achilles tendon. The guy in the back here, um, you know, he fakes it. He has a really funky ear infection by putting rotten cheese and egg in it and honey. Um, this guy is this more innocuous. This guy's reading really close. Um, he basically is pretending that he's uh, nearsighted because that, that was one of the ways you can get uh, off. And this is very comical. This, this figure, um, he, he pretends... Um, he just kind of walks around bent over all day, pretending that his back is out. So, and he did that for like eight months. So sometimes, the, what the soldiers put themselves through to try to cheat themselves out of serving seemed much more painful and arduous than what it would have been to actually serve. So what I'm have, showing here is also just the compositional map. Uh, these are not the, uh, the actual works that are in the gallery. Um, this is kind of the mapping I did. They were all individually illustrated, and then I kind of laid them out on computer, and then projected it onto the hide, and then um, illustrated it. So there's a fella chopping off a finger. This guy's like pouring some sort of uh, acid uh, on his leg wound. Um, this character has an extra arm and is snorting snuff, smoking a cigarette, and putting lime in his eye. Uh, this guy is shooting his arm hand off. Um, but, okay, this is the, the cuter one. It's, it's, this one's a lot kind of funnier. So what we have here is kind of like a panel. This is kind of like a medic tent with, with the doctors there, right? So there's these, some of these are the tests. Um, on uh, this side, this figure here, um, actually that sounds good. Let, let's go to the back one, this scene going on right here. Um, there's a doctor basically uh, with a feather wiggling it on a, a, um, a soldier's nose who's asleep. So basically, this is a situation where a soldier says, ah, my arm, this is totally unusable. My right arm, my good arm, doesn't work, uh, you know. So the doctor tests the validity of that claim by uh, feeding him opiates so he's passed out. And then at night, and then he ties uh, his good arm down and then waves a finger on his nose so that if it really is not working, nothing would happen. But if he was lying, he would like scratch his nose because it's itchy and stuff. Anyways, I thought that was kind of cute. Um, so, anyways, there's a variant, variant of uh, you know cases that I've depicted here, and interest, you know, interestingly enough, I kind of butt ended it, uh, kind of book ended it, the panoramic with uh, the White House uh, in flames on one side, and uh, kind of Fort Fort York. You will see it will be exploding also. So. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I think that's, those are the three pieces. So hopefully everyone uh, could make it over, preferably after this talk, for the opening. Uh, and you can play some pinball and ask me informal <laughs> questions. Um, and uh, if not, uh, it'll be up till, you know, early September. So hopefully you get a chance to see the show. Thank you all.